Hey folks, you're Absolute Packer Podcast initiating in 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Hello out there, Packer Nation. Welcome to Absolute Packer Podcast, Episode 2, where we uh, we actually have some, some air quotes, real football to talk about, although it's preseason. Uh, so you know that the, uh, the, the regular season is coming around the corner and there's some, some real, real good football coming around. Um, we got uh, a lot of topics to go over today. I got well, to go to the game. Yay! Good for you. Couldn't be more perfect. And what was funny, I don't know if you noticed, but like a half hour before the game, it was like hailing or yeah, it was, it looked like, you know, biblical type weather. And then the, the skies parted and, and it was beautiful. I, I watched it at home on my TV, but it would have been cool to be there. Yeah, it was, su- it was super nice. Where do you want to start? Yeah. Our buddy LaTroy guy. On. We said last time, and I know I got the episode out a little later than I was supposed to. Sorry about that. We were talking about, he should, he probably should go. Yeah. And he did. <laughs> yes, he did. Um, and you know the truth with with Latroy Guy on. Let's let's be honest. The reason he stayed on the team as long as he did is because they didn't have a whole lot of depth on the defensive line. And Latroy Guy on was a pretty good player. You know, I would say he's average to slightly above average. So the reason he stayed and got all these chances is because they needed a body. Um, but there's only so much you can take. And he got a another DUI, and this is like his fifth strike. So. I don't know what other body or uh, other player is going to step up to, to fill his void, but I, I got to think that Ted and the other guys just said, I, I've had it. I've never seen a player under Ted's regime last this long with, with so many issues off the field. So it, w- it was a little strange, but, but yeah, he's gone. So they're a little thinner, but he did need to go. <laughs> I don't think there's much else to say about that, really. Yeah. Well, the one other thing that was interesting, they interviewed real quick, they interviewed Kenny Clark, who's uh, the uh, second year nose tackle. So he's basically took over for BJ Raji and he had nothing but glowing things to say about guy on as a teammate, which is interesting. And Mike McCarthy did too, in his press conference, he said, we have to do, what we have to do, but the, his teammates absolutely loved him. But in the end, you only get so many strikes against you. So I guess he's a beloved teammate, but it's uh, it's business, man. Well, it is. And uh, we want to win and uh, we're, we're slated to win. I, I think uh, that was one thing that I didn't add to our list that I should. Mm. The Vegas odds, <laughs> oh. and I want to see if they went up be- after the uh, the thing we'll talk about later. Okay, yeah, yeah. This is going into a little bit prior to the actual uh, the preseason game, but I had talked about the previous podcast that they're really thin at outside linebacker in terms of depth. And the guy I, I talked about briefly is, is Kyler Kyler Fackrell is his name. He's a second year player. Uh, I can't remember what college he went to, but he's actually an older guy. I want to say he's 25 or 26 already, and they need him to make some kind of jump, if anything, to just you know maybe push some other guys for playing time. But he's been invisible, <laughs> which is somewhat depressing. And if he doesn't do anything soon, they're going to have to bring somebody else in because behind Clay Matthews and behind Nick Perry, they got a bunch of nobodies. You know, they got – bodies and that's it it's Fackrell and J. Ron Elliott who's basically a special teams player so you know Clay Matthews and Nick Perry the chances of them playing an entire season is pretty darn low so if one of those guys goes down they're in a world of hurt because in the 3-4 defense you need to rush the passer and Fackrell's got to make a jump but he's just a guy right now and even Winston Moss I think his uh, position coach called him out and said he needs to <laughs> do this, this, and this better. And the things he mentioned were like rudimentary things. You're going, oh, God. So I don't know. Maybe he'll improve. Maybe he'll make a jump. You know, there's three more preseason games and more training camp. But right now, the returns are not good. So that's still high on my list of worries, the defense and the depth there. Well, let's talk about the game a little bit. Yes, it was great to finally see football. It's so funny because, when you know, when you live in Green Bay and when I was driving home from work, you see so many people walking around getting ready with all their Packers shirts on and you're like, Oh, there's a game. And then you're like, Oh my God, it's just a preseason game. But you, you remember that it's even that is a humongous deal in green Bay. So it's, it's good to see that just in terms of the community and all that. I would say my, my number one thing when I watch a preseason game with the Packers, and especially the last few years is the number one priority is getting out of that game healthy. They, they could lose 58 to nothing. And if they don't lose any players, that's good. They did 
have some injuries, unfortunately. The earliest returns the next day after are that they're not as bad as they seemed, but they did, still did. I think they had five players that suffered some kind of injury, so that's a little disconcerting. And some of the injuries were vicious hits. Uh, Demarius Randall, the cornerback, got blindsided. On, it was just a, he had a concussion. It looked like he. I thought he injured his groin just by the way he was walking, and they put him up on there. But he was he had a concussion. He got blindsided. So if you happen to see the film, he got whacked. Uh, it was it was a borderline cheap shot, but it was still football. And then Malachi Dupree, the rookie receiver out of LSU, who's really intriguing. He's really fast. And I think he could be a good player. He got leveled, and you were at the game. I mean, it was scary. I agree. It had been a long time since I saw a hit where I was like, "Man, that guy." He's an. I thought he was knocked out cold, like I said, for a good 30 seconds, but it turns out he's okay. Well, he it was scary his- for us because we were way on the, on the like Southwest side of the, the stadium. And that was like on the Northeast yeah. side where it happened. So it was, way it far was away. very far away and it was quiet. Everybody went quiet and they don't show the replays like they do on TV for good reason, I guess. Yeah. They don't want to keep, you know, putting that up there like robot gladiator type stuff. It's, it's kind of gruesome, but yeah, both, I mean, it was quiet. They went on a commercial break and both teams took a knee when they came back, they had him on a stretcher. I'm like, oh, my goodness. But he already tweeted out he's back at practice. He's in the concussion protocol, which, <laughs> uh, yeah, he got a concussion on that play. But that was a vicious hit. Vicious hit. You could see his head get nailed. Yeah. And when he fell down, his arms were, like, sitting up. It was a weird position he ended up in. It looked so unnatural. It was just – but he's okay. So, you know, but, it, man, it looked bad. And then there were a couple other, uh, I think Don Barclay, their, their backup center. They used to use him as a backup tackle. I have no idea why he's terrible at that, but he could be a guard. He, center is probably his position, but he had a high ankle sprain. It looked like he tore his knee up. He'll be out for a few weeks, I'm sure. Hey, I want to circle back to what you said about I mean, Green Bay. Like it's even a, the first preseason game is a big deal. Yeah. When I was at the game, my dad pointed out that he went down to Nashville for the game last year during the regular season. Yep. They had empty rows of seats at the top of their stadium for a regular season game when the Packers are in town and half the people in the stadium were there for the Packers. So, you know, it is kind of cool that we can pack the joint, even in preseason. Yeah, I I, I agree. At at times you kind of go, oh, my goodness, really? You got all this stuff. But at the same time, the passion, you can't deny the passion and loyalty. And, And let's face it, to your point, what you said about them traveling down to Tennessee, which as an aside, that was the game they got their ass kicked. They were down 21 to nothing before I could even take a breath. Well, he, he, he made that comment, too. <laughs> <laughs> we're watching that go. Everybody was wide open, touchdowns. I'm going, oh, my goodness. Yeah, I mean, the Packers travel as well as visiting fans as anybody in the world, let alone just the NFL. It's, it's insane. It really is incredible. That's definitely cool. But we did win. And also, the Vikings won. Damn it. Oh, <laughs> it's preseason. They just barely beat the Bills, but you know, whatever. Yeah, I hear you. I think it's still good to take stock of the division. I mean, I, I still get afraid of the the rivals no matter what. Yeah, I think you got to keep them close in your rearview mirror. I mean, I don't think the Bears are going to be much. The Lions, who knows? The Vikings, they seem to be the closest to threaten the Packers on paper, at least. My take when I was at the game was that Packers were unable to run the ball. I agree. And Hundley did, he played well, hard to tell. It probably doesn't matter. And it seemed like uh, defensively, we didn't do as good as we ended up kind of doing. Uh, And I guess that's turnovers. I think we had five fumbles. I made a note here that this is the thing with preseason too. Typically, the first couple series is the first string offense versus the first string defense. Typically, it can it can change from here and there. But, you know, obviously, we didn't have the first string offense by default because Aaron Rodgers didn't play. You could have all the first teamers you have out there. If Aaron Rodgers isn't out there, you don't have the first string offense out there. That's kind of with a grain of salt. But the first string defense, they folded like a cheap suit again. It was very annoying against they had they gave up a TD right away. And you know, I think it was uh Matthews, on the, on the play that rendered a TD, Matthews had a sack in his hands, slipped right through. Wentz comes out, finds a wide-open guy, and our rookie cornerback, Kevin King, who he's going to take his lumps. They say that the hardest position in NFL football behind quarterback is cornerback. You have no help. You're on an island, so that you're going to take your lumps. Yeah, He got a bad angle, and he got stiff-armed, and the guy just ran right in the end zone, and I'm going, yuck, yuck, yuck. <laughs> Even if it's the preseason, I mean, you want to see good tackling. You don't want to see your first-round pick get stiff-armed to the ground like he got he whiffed on air. 
So that was a little disheartening. It's still preseason. And the one thing I did notice about the uh, the defense in general, whether it was first string, second string, or whatever, there's more speed. They were flying around. This package that they're running on defense, uh, I don't know if you've heard of it. It's called the Nitro Package, which is code for they're basically taking safeties and making them into inside linebackers. Morgan Burnett is basically an inside linebacker for all intents and purposes. And Jones, I think, is uh, John. Oh, I forgot his name. My goodness. He's a Jones' last name. I don't want to butcher it. They drafted him as a safety, but he's really going to take the place of an inside linebacker. They need speed there, and they're fast there now. That's that's pretty impressive to watch. Because in the past, they've had a lot of slow inside linebackers. Yikes. Martinez and Jake Ryan, they're guys. I'm sorry. They're just guys. They're just guys. <laughs> jag, jags, as I call them. Just a guy. A jag. I don't know if you've ever heard that term, but it's like, they're just jags. That's all they are. Wentz played uh, he, quarterback for the Eagles. He was four for four for 56 yards, scored on his first series. Uh, that was pretty impressive. Well, when you play against Dom Capers, you know, we make his defense tends to. I made a, a comment, you know, before we started the podcast that it, it's true in some regards that the fact that opposing quarterbacks that struggle versus others, we make them look like Joe Montana. I mean, the guy had a perfect, this guy had a perfect rating. You guys know how I feel about Dom Capers. I don't want to ruminate on it too much. A lot of people feel that way. This defense is the thing that scares me from the only thing that makes me nervous about this team, barring injuries to other players, is this defense. And until they can show me something, whether it's preseason in real life, I mean, obviously in the uh, the re- regular season, going to be way more important than the preseason. But this defense, I don't really have much of any confidence in them at all. I just don't because the past history proves that they, they're not very good. <laughs> That's all I can say. Wentz, I think, is going to be a good player. He's only a second-year player. <laughs> My next bullet there was they only got 33 uh, rushing yards. That's cool. Yeah. Kenny Clark, their nose tackle for the Packers, he had a good game. I'm intrigued by him. He's a second-year player. He's only like 21 years old, really young. But I think he's going to be a great run stopper. I think he's going to be a good, a really good player. So stopping the run is good. I wasn't paying a ton of attention to the safeties coming in instead of inside linebackers, but I got to imagine Morgan Burnett and Jones, the new safety, helped out there. So that's good. If you can't stop the run, then you're not going to stop the pass. If you stop the run, you make teams one-dimensional, you can shut things down. So that's definitely good. The last of our little notes on the game, Ty Montgomery, he didn't get very many opportunities and uh, dropped the ball. They kind of go hand in hand. (laughs) Is that a concern? I'll say this, you know, with Mike McCarthy, if you fumble, you're in the doghouse. I mean, it doesn't matter if you're Eddie Lacy, if you're uh, Adrian Peterson. And what was what was disconcerting about Montgomery was he fumbled on the second carry of the game. You can't have your, your quote, bell cow every down back fumble on the second carry of the game. It's a bad look, whether it's preseason or not. And, you know, they didn't do much running the ball in general, whether it's blocking or something else, vanilla schemes. I can't. I, I'm not quite sure. You know, I still think Ty Montgomery is going to be a weapon because they're going to try and use him more to disguise passing game because he played receiver. So they were, I think they were just trying to make him be a running back in this game just to get him in the flow. But fumbling on the second play of the game is not good. Offensively, are we giving up on running? Well, taking a step back, <laughs> I think McCarthy always says we want to run the football, we want to run the football. And everybody always says that. But they've never had the right kind of running back in my mind. Eddie Lacy, he's gone now. We need like a the, the, the best kind of running back, I think, that would fit this offense. We don't have him, obviously, would be like a Darren Sproles. A shifty, really fast kind of back that you can you can dump it off on a screen pass and whatnot. And we've always had you know, either mediocre general running backs or when you had a talented running back like an Eddie Lacy, he's a bruiser. He's not a speedy guy. Montgomery can be speedy and he can catch the ball and play quasi receiver too. So that's why it's intriguing. I really hope that they really use his strengths in the passing game to confuse people. So you're not going to see much of that in the preseason. They're not going to tip their hand, but they're a passing team. They got Aaron Rodgers for Pete's sake. Best player in the league. So I think I think it's more about, and I think even McCarthy said this, it's about the quality of the running, not the quantity. I think this kind of segues into your next little bullet on business league stuff. Ooh, the odds. I see this. So this is the NFC North that I have up in, the, in our little document here. Packers are two to five odds, uh, which means like if you bet against them, you're, 
you're going to lose. The Bears are 20 to 1 to win the division. I think that that's pretty phenomenal to make that prediction. This was before the game. Before a ball was snapped, that was the prediction. You know what? I, it, it is on the surface, but I'll tell you this. You know why it's that? Why these odds are the way they are? It's Aaron Rodgers, and they got him some offensive weapons. They got him two tight ends, and they've got returning veteran wide receivers. I mean, you would think on paper that this offense is going to be phenomenal. It might be the best one they've had since 2011 when they went 15-1 and one, because we have not had a decent tight end since Jermichael Finley. And I got news for people. Martellus Bennett is twice the tight end that Jermichael Finley was. Michael Finley had a lot of a lot of talent, but he wasn't a sound player. Bennett's got a lot of talent, and he's he's a sound player. So they, in theory, they should be their offense should just be humming. I'm talking passing offense, and then you throw in you know Ty Montgomery being a weapon in the pass and and in running game, they should be. So we got the best player in the league. That helps. Just because I have it up on the screen, the 49ers to get to uh, win the Super Bowl are 125 to one. <laughs> and the Bears are the next worst at 60, I think 66 to 1. What about the Browns? That's interesting. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. That's not even right. So that's the NFC Championship. So it's even worse than that. So the 49ers are 300 to 1, but they are better than the New York Jets. Oh, God. That are 500 to 1 odds. The New York Jets, I don't want to talk about them too much, but... I've seen that they might be one of the worst teams we've seen in the last decade. They have, it, it's all, oh man, I feel bad for Jets fans. They just, they're going to be horrific. I don't feel bad for them. They came to town one time and they have some obnoxious fans. Well, it is New York. Yeah. Coming in the big old city folk coming into small green Bay. Yeah. The Patriots are, are up on top 11 to four odds to win that. And that makes some sense, right? But the next team on the list is the Cowboys with 8-1 to one odds. Really? This was kind of before the news, right? So then uh, next on the list is the Seahawks. And then it, basically the Seahawks and the Packers are kind of neck and neck kind of neck and neck there. Uh, and actually, the, the Cowboys are too. It's kind of a tight race. But, you know, as far as the Vegas odds go, the Cowboys were uh, the top of the three. Then we had the news that Zeke was, he's going to be out for six games which includes the one against us, against the Packers. Correct. I don't know all the details of it, but I know that domestic violence was involved. And after the debacle that was Ray Rice a few years ago, the NFL isn't messing around with that. And Jerry Jones is probably the most powerful owner in the league, right? The most influence outside of, well, he is the most powerful owner. And anything around domestic violence is, is obviously very, very bad. So six games, uh, not terribly surprising. I mean, rumor has, or I should say rumor, the, what's, what I've seen on Twitter is that, you know, Jerry Jones is apparently absolutely furious with the league. But again, this is involving domestic violence, which is a really hot button topic for good reason. And Ezekiel Elliott's a fantastic player. I mean, him and Dak Prescott last year, they were a fantastic duo of rookies. I mean, you have a, a rookie quarterback who's pretty good who could rely on darn near the best running back in the league. So the first few games are going to be interesting. Uh, for the Cowboys, because basically teams, if they're if they're smart, are just going to say, "All right, Dak, beat us." You know, you're going to have to beat us because you're not going to have a running back. And truth be told, Elliott's going to appeal the suspension, and there's a good chance he could get it reduced to four games, which means we will face him, and he will be very fresh because he wouldn't have played and taken all these hits. So um, there's a good chance we could still play him, but it's still a big story. The last time I looked at the, the Cowboys roster, I mean, like everybody knows, I care about the Packers more than anything. I, I follow other rosters really on the periphery, and that includes everyone, every team in the league, not just the NFC North. There's a lot of guys in trouble. <laughs> there's there's a lot of uh, – it's like the inmates running the asylum with, with uh, Dallas. They have a lot of other players that are, are not choir boys. So as a fan, I hope he's still suspended. <laughs> I don't want to see him. <laughs> So one other brief thing. So we play the Seahawks week one. We play the Falcons in week two. And they're actually, Falcons are next on the list. All these teams are, you know, hot contention, really. We play them both up front. Then we play the Cowboys week five. The season can take, and it will in some fashion, because somebody's not going to win, right? Things will be, look very different in October, one way or the other. 
we opened against Seattle and that's at home. I mean, that really helps because we knocked the crap out of Seattle at home last time. And I think Seattle, I think, peaked a couple of years ago. I think they could still be good. They got Eddie Lacy now. And I don't know how hell bent he's going to be on wanting to stick it to the Packers or whatever, but it's the opener. I could see Eddie Lacy running all over us again. I don't have faith. I don't have any faith in our defense. And nobody's going to know that better than Eddie Lacy. So (laughs) if they do great, you know, week two against the Falcons. I mean, you saw what Julio Jones did to us in the NFC championship game. Now our best cornerback was Gunter, Ladarius Gunter, because they were so injured there, but there, there still is not even today a cornerback that the Packers have that can match up with Julio Jones. There, there's few in the league, but we don't have anybody close. I mean, Kevin King might be the best one that we have, and he's a rookie, and that makes me nervous too. So, Demarius Randall, uh, uh-uh. Quentin Rollins, uh, uh-uh. uh, King, I don't think so. And then after that drop off, you have Gunter, who's already been playing. And, He's been getting smoked in practice. You know, he was an undrafted rookie, so he he kind of is what he is. But you know, the Falcons isn't going to be any gimme game, and they're opening up. That's at their their new stadium. That's right. So that'll be on the road. Defense, defense, defense. All up to this defense. You know, I think we're going to be hard on offense to stop anybody to, for us to stop us, but our defense has got to do something. Patriots. They have they they got a plane. They got two actually. Believe it or not, they bought two, and they're huge. 767 or something like 10 million bucks a piece. And the reason I put this on as a, as a topic, yeah, is this is a, it was kind of surprising. This is the, the Patriots are the first team in the league to have their own jets. So all of their teams include the Packers. They either, they charter jets, you know, they're not flying commercial, but they charter jets. They don't own their own fleet, you know, everything about it. And I did a little bit of research on the reason the Patriots did that is, you know, they want to basically control, everything about the team, you know, including, you know, they want to own their own plane. So they want to be able to, to get guys home quicker and to the next place quicker and give them rest. On the surface, it's interesting. And it's just another one of these things that the Patriots do that they're out in front of everybody else. I don't even think we can fly 767s into Austin Straubel Field. I don't know. I mean, I guess they can land. I mean, there's we have plenty of space. Austin Straubel is a bustling airport, Elliot. I don't know what you're talking about. They they have all of they have all of two gates. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I guess Air Force One landed there, right? So I mean, they they must be able to handle it in some fashion. The best thing about Austin Straubel is if you're if you're traveling, you can leave a half an hour before a flight and still get there on time. Oh yeah, <laughs> that's the only airport I've ever seen you can still do that after nine eleven. Which is awesome, by the way. It's awesome, but at the t- same time, you're like, my goodness. I want you to talk about the logo and uh, some of the work you did there, and then we have a caller. Cool, caller, caller. Uh, yeah, in terms of branding, uh, for those who don't know, I'm a graphic designer by trade. So I love everything about design, art, branding, things like that. So when the podcast came around, it was an opportunity and a challenge to come up with uh, some branding assets and a logo for it. Uh, for those who haven't seen it yet, when I sit down, I'll kind of go through some of my process, how I do it. When I sit down to make a logo, I kind of have a zillion different things flying through my head and I do digital sketches. I play with certain ideas and I'll put them over here and then I'll just kind of move them around. I was working with the idea of a cheese head and like a football and trying to make like headphones and it wasn't really going anywhere. And then sometimes the best things happen either by accident or just out of chance. I had a cheese head graphic and I happened to, to twist it or turn it on the screen, I turned it uh, 90 degrees. And when I turned it 90 degrees, it was like one of these, I call them an aha moment. That is a play button. So I kind of stopped everything I was doing and just went and put it right in there and said, this is essentially done. The new logo is, uh, it's out and it's up on, uh, on our social media and the, and the website. And I'm, I'm pretty proud of it. The logos that I typically do and the branding I do is, is typically pretty minimalistic. I don't go crazy with things. I like to do things that are pretty simple. I and mean, I like to be clever. And I think this one's pretty clever. And I think it fits well. So I'm pretty proud of that. I love it. I think it's amazing. Are you happy with the font that you're using? Fonts are an interesting topic, right? I want to get that logo out everywhere. And I don't know if you're going to change it. Yeah, I'm good with it. We can actually keep the logo as is with that typeface and then move uh, to, to the other Google font that, that's free that we can embed. And the beauty of the logo, too, is like when I saw it, I was like, man, this would look great on stickers. This would look great on T-shirts. And I think it's killer. On all kinds of media. I think it looks good. And it's a nice circle. 
you know, it just happened. I was like, oh, look at this. I went crazy when I saw it. I'm like, yes, like that is so much it. I love the play button. If I can make it look good, I might steal the cheese head play button idea for the actual episodes. We'll see how that goes. We're going to kind of close with our caller. Hello, um, this is Trisha now calling, and I have two uh, actual ideas for uh, Green Bay Packers show. Um, my first, the Packers wanting to talk to the Village Board on August 22nd about making Ron Wolf way by honoring Ron Wolf for his big benefits that he's given to the Packers as a whole by making a street in the new Titletown District, Ron Wolf Way. The reason is for that is that what he did is he hired Mike Holmgren, and then he was able to get a trade to get Brett Favre, and he also signed Reggie White. So those are three big things that Ron Wolf did for the Packers. My question to you is, if Ron Wolf Way is put into effect, I know that we have Holmgren and then we have Tony Cannadale. How many other Packer streets do we have in Green Bay? Also, leading into my next thing is Brett Favre, of course, number four, the biggest star of Green Bay, who I have feelings for since I served him many drinks over the years. And he was in town this week uh, receiving an honorary award at a banquet in De Pere for his playing. The award actually is given to them, and the money is contributed to the De Pere Rotary Club to give to scholarships. And when Brett was here, he accepted in person. I thought it was really interesting that, you know, I don't think him and Aaron Rodgers were ever very close when he was playing here, but he made a comment to Aaron. Kind of got cut off there at the end, but what she had said was that Brett Farr played till he was in his 40s and things weren't real good with he and Aaron Rodgers. Who's he to say? <laughs> Things were not good with Aaron Rodgers. That is the understatement of the decade. <laughs> if you read, uh, just real quickly, I want to throw this in there. So uh, Jeff, uh, Jeff Perlman wrote a book uh, a few years ago called Gunslinger. It was an unauthorized biography uh, of Brett Favre. I think one of the only ones that's out there. And I, I got it for Christmas, I think, last year. It's a fantastic book. Again, it's unauthorized. But the, the chapter on the relationship with, with Brett Favre and Aaron Rodgers is something else. That's, I'll put it at that. To say that they didn't like each other uh, is putting it mildly. Do you think that Roger should play till he drops? Uh, I don't know if he should play till he drops, but I think Favre has said this in the past, that as long as you can play at a high level, play as long as you can. And I think with the way football's going and the way they treat quarterbacks, and when I say they, I mean the league and how defenses can't barely touch them, and it's going to just get worse and worse for defenses and easier and easier for quarterbacks – if you're a quarterback of Aaron Rodgers' athletic ability and discipline, he's changed his whole eating habits, his workout routines. He's in, he's probably in better shape now at 33 than he was when he was 22. There's no reason that he couldn't play that long into his early 40s. There's no, I mean, look at Tom Brady just turned 40, and he could have won the MVP last year. The guy is phenomenal. Now, these are outliers compared to the rest of the people in the league, but I would venture to say just pure talent. Uh, Aaron Rodgers is the best the league he's ever seen. It's He's everything. He's the whole entire package, and he may be getting better. Yeah, it's entirely possible he could play into his early to maybe even mid-40s. Two quick things on that. He doesn't eat cheese. Well, that's a problem. Going back to the, the what we were just talking about with the logo, you know, I think that's funny and interesting. The more serious thing was Brett Favre also said that he really doesn't want his grandkids to play football. He'd rather they play golf. It doesn't surprise me, to be honest. Now, if you look at Favre, again, he played in the 90s where concussions and CTE were, weren't even on the radar. Many people didn't even think about it. it. You know, people knew that it wasn't good to play pro football, but they didn't know how catastrophic it could be. And he was driven to play differently than other the longevity and wanting to be the best and all that. So, I mean, he played 20 years in the NFL, which is a really long career. There's not many people who play that long. And he got the hell beat out of him. He was the last of the generation of quarterbacks where it wasn't patty cake and you could barely touch him. You could get, you could knock the crap out of these guys. I mean, there's a YouTube video of all the sacks that Brett Favre took. You should see that. It is like 20 minutes long. I have seen it. <laughs> at least 25 years of getting the hell beat out of you. And if you look at ex players with CTE and all that, I got, if you get the feeling Brett Favre's terrified that what he's going to, what he's going to become in the next few years 
he got the hell beat out of him. It's unknown. So I, I think, you know, now that he knows and he's aware of the, the science and how bad it really can be, you know, he's a father of girls, not boys, but a father. I mean, I don't blame him. I, it makes perfect sense, to be honest with you. The NFL, I'm sure, hates it, though. Goodell's going, why are you doing this? Let's uh, take things back just a little bit. Brett Favre was in town for the that award ceremony in De Pere. They give Favre, they're giving him all these, I don't want to say they're like made-up awards, but it seems like he's coming back every other week for some kind of banquet. And I'm sure, you know, they're, they're either going to charity, the money, and the fun. So it's, I'm ready for, I'm kind of through with him. <laughs> so other than it being for a good cause, it's really kind of meaningless. Yeah, I, I, I can get behind that, yeah. So what about Ron Wolf Way? I had made the comment to you before the podcast started, totally forgotten that Ron Wolf doesn't have a street named after Green Bay, which I was stunned. There's a lot of streets named after Packers in Green Bay to that point. I mean, there's Brett Favre Pass, there's Home Green Way, there's Reggie White Drive, there's there's a lot of streets. Most of those are in Ashwaubenon. That's true. That's true. But yeah, I would have thought that uh, Ron Wolf already had a street, so I was a little surprised he didn't. Um, I mean, I'm fine with it. Ron Wolf was... In terms of the Trinity, if you will, they call the Trinity of what brought the Packers back to greatness being Ron Wolf, Mike Holmgren, and Brett Favre. Ron Wolf was the head of that tree. Without Ron Wolf, you don't have Holmgren, and without Ron Wolf and Holmgren, you don't have Favre. He's definitely very important to that. And being in Green Bay ad nauseum, they love to honor these past guys. You know, before Favre, you know, he's obviously getting honored all the time now because he's back in the good graces with the franchise. But, I mean, Ron Wolf, it's, I think he still lives in De Pere. Um, he spends a lot of time. He's at training camp practice all the time with his son, Elliot. People love Ron Wolf for what he did and how he reclamated the Packers, and, and he's constantly around. Yeah, he deserves a street. So does um, Bao Zhu. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> he was just some uh, middling quarterback or cornerback that played with Mike Sherman. I always loved his name, Bao Zhu. So that's just a very random thing I throw we do have one in Green Bay. I think we have a few in in the city of Green Bay, but we have Donald Driver Way. That just happened not that long ago. Is that right by Titletown Brewery? It sure is. And I am ready for real football. You know, let's hope the injuries, any of the injuries that did happen um, from the preseason game aren't uh, severe on any regard. The early returns are they won't be. There may be out a couple weeks and whatnot, but, you know, the last thing the Packers need is anybody to go down for a significant period of time or be lost for the season or something like that. So we got to get to the regular season healthy. It's a, They have a pretty tough schedule. And like I said, I mean, this defense is the albatross that's been around this team's neck. They could win every game, but they could lose every game, with the exception of a couple. The Packers got to score. We got to put up 30 points every game, it seems, because the defense just, they haven't had it. So I've, I've been beating that dead horse, though. And I'm just going on history. It's been six, five, six years of middling at best defense. All I'm asking for is a middle of the road defense. <laughs> I'm not asking for a top ten or top five. I'm like, well, I mean, we'll see. I, I mean, the, I, I, they didn't look that terrible in this first preseason game, but it is preseason, and you know, it's hard, it, it's so hard to tell. Our next game is at Redskins. Kirk Cousins. Probably making more money than Aaron Rodgers on a one-year franchise tag. It's hilarious. Our next one will be right after that. So Yes. Podcast, podcast, chair. I know, right?